Ladies and gentlemen, today is an exciting day. I finally added something to my arsenal of tools that I've wanted for quite a long time. In fact, two, but I'll be getting to that in a second. This is my new aluminum foundry. I say new, but of course it's made out of recycled materials. And I'll be going over it in just a little bit to explain exactly how it works, because I know that's why you're here, but I'm gonna give you a little bit of a demonstration just on the overall function. So this is actually a waste oil powered aluminum foundry. Waste oil burning does get more than hot enough to melt down aluminum, which has a melting point of about 1,221 degrees Fahrenheit, which is about 660 degrees Celsius or about 933 degrees Kelvin. So anyway, not terribly hot and well within the range of our waste oil burning. But as I mentioned before, it is a foundry, and if you're not familiar with what a foundry is, basically it's just some sort of vessel or something. They can be run off of electricity, wood, charcoal, propane, and a number of other gases, and they just burn that material in order to get a high enough temperature to melt down metal, in this case aluminum, which has a relatively low melting temperature. So this is really the body of the foundry, and then here's the cool part. If we pull this lever, put it down here, it sits nicely on the stand, and then suddenly we have a forge. And that's all thanks to this little slip coupler I made here. Very, very simple. I'll explain that in just a little bit. But from here, we can take our bar material or whatever else we're trying to forge, put it in here, let it get red hot, take it out where it's nice and malleable, put it on our anvil and hammer it into whatever we're trying to create. So it's multi-purpose. I've been able to achieve two things that I've really wanted in one package, so it'll take up less space. And most importantly, like I said, it is powered off of waste oil, which burns in that vessel there. We have our air intake there, and we have our oil line in there. Now, if you're not familiar with how oil burners work, I will be going over that, but not right at this second. I know I'm leaving you guys on a lot of cliffhangers, but hold on, we'll get there. So here's the reason why I went with waste oil for fuel instead of a traditional propane or even just a charcoal burning system. Just so you have an idea of my logic and reasoning before you decide to try to build one of these for yourself. Now, I have an abundance of waste oil because I do all of my own oil changes on my vehicles. And even if that weren't the case, if you go to most shops or garages, waste oil is abundantly available and most of the time it's in fact free. This is just a great way for me to use that up and also use it in a very practical way. I don't have to go through the burden of taking it to a recycling place, which is definitely what you should do if you don't have a way to dispose of it properly. But in this case, I'm able to get a practical and functional application from it. So anyway, it's a good way to get rid of it. It works very well for a system like this. And that's just my logic. Okay, so now we're gonna get on to the actual build, which I'm sure you're waiting for. But if you're not interested in seeing how I built it, there will be a final explanation at the very end of that. And so skip to this timestamp. If you just wanna see the final results, this here, functioning as well as a total explanation of the whole process from beginning to end. So anyway, I'll see you on the other side. So right over here on the floor by my fiberglass leaf spring, hint, hint, I've got this old air compressor tank. Now the top is off, but I can weld it back on. And I think this is going to be my burn vessel. It doesn't need to be all that big. And in fact, I think it's better to have it undersized than it is oversized. Otherwise we might be burning all of our fuel before it actually gets into the foundry itself. And I don't really want that. So I think this is a good size. This is about six inches in diameter. And I want to say it's probably about 18 inches tall. So I'm going to set that aside. And then for the foundry part, I'm going to use a propane tank. Because I want it to be tall enough that I'll be able to put it on its side and have a relatively long item all heating at once uh, for forging purposes. And also if I can put a pretty decent sized crucible in there so I can melt down a lot of aluminum at once for a large pour, that would be fantastic too. But yeah, I've done a lot of talking and I think that's gonna end soon because this project is so simple, I'm just gonna work my way through it, kinda guide you along the way. So stay tuned and I hope you enjoy. For those of you that don't know what I'm about to do, prepare for some serious cringe.
So I'll be doing a verbal walk around of this entire project once it's all put together just so you can better see and understand it. So if there's something that you didn't quite get or didn't quite understand in this build process, then don't worry, I'll cover it in a bit. But at this point, I think our functional parts are done and so we can actually go and do a test burn in this just to make sure that this is hopefully gonna work before putting all the effort into the next step. This will be cut down to size later, but for now I'm gonna leave that as long as it is just because I don't wanna be left with less material than I need later on. Okay, so I've got everything in a test setup right now. I've got my oil there that I borrowed from my waste oil furnace. So first thing you're going to do is turn on your oil supply. I'm using a gate valve. Now it's not terribly warm, so it'll take a minute to flow all the way down there. All right, I'm gonna let that burn for a minute and get well established, and then I'll turn my fan on. We've got a good cyclone going, and I'm not sure if you can tell, there is oil dripping in through that feed line. So I guess now we just wait. So what I actually ended up doing, this was an interesting sort of counterintuitive thing that I really wouldn't have guessed, but uh, if there's too much airflow, what you end up with is just a cyclone running around, also ignore those leaks, the cyclone running around, but it just stays circular because it's moving so fast that the heat doesn't have time to lift the flame up and out that outlet. And so what happens is you burn all the fuel before it reaches the exit. That'll do. That was certainly a success. So I've shut the blower down now and we can do a quick overview. I felt the oil in tube and it's all cool, so no issues with, hopefully, no issues with oil burning inside of the feed tube. And all the solder over here and this metal is cold, so I don't have to worry about any of this melting. So if it can withstand it, I think we're golden. Also, I just posted this on my Instagram, so if you're interested in seeing more of these projects and more in-depth details and fun updates, then follow me at rando underscore monium if you're interested in getting some extra content. All right, so I've taken it inside and I used a wire brush to clean up all that old burnt off paint. And now we're down to bare metal and we're ready to go for the frame. Now the frame is just gonna be relatively simple. Uh, in fact, I'll probably do most of it off camera because you'll get a very good idea of how it's constructed just in the final imagery. Also on a totally different note, I finally upgraded my welding hood to my very first auto darkening hood, so it's pretty sweet. We're actually going to start on the main foundry body, basically the thing that you would put your crucible in to actually receive heat from the burn vessel and melt. So this is what I'm going to be using, it's an old propane tank I've had laying around for a while. It used to be an air tank, but now it's getting a new life. So this will need to be somewhere up about there. What's going to happen is this will act as a pivot point. It'll be going in at an angle to hopefully generate somewhat of a cyclone inside of this. It will be cutting the top off, of course, but basically we're going to have another piece of this old axle welded into the side, and then it'll have a collar that just slips over this here. So what'll happen is hopefully it'll receive all the heat from the burn vessel, but it'll still be able to turn. And I'll just sort of eyeball a corresponding pivot point on the opposite side, weld on a pin, and then I'll make a mount for that. All right, so that's first order of business. We're also going to need to make a way to latch it in both the foundry position and the forge position, which will be down in a cradle that'll be mounted somewhere right about there. All right, so now that the body of our foundry, the main component is essentially done with that lid cut off. Next, we're going to need to put a lining on the inside, probably about two and a quarter inches thick in my case, and that'll act as an insulator. Now, this is usually some sort of refractory cement or kaol or fire brick or some other uh, something that's fireproof that can withstand high temperatures and is also a good insulator. So in my case, I'm going to be going with a mix that you've probably heard of before on the Grant Thompson King of Random channel. He made a metal foundry a while back and he used a 50-50 mix of plaster of Paris and sand. 
seem to work well enough. So I think that's what I'm going to go with because it's also very cost effective. Refractory cement, the actual refractory cement that you would go to the store and purchase is very, very expensive. And filling a void of this size would be a little out of my price range. So because we'll be dealing with dusty conditions, let's take this outside. All right, so I got everything laid out and I'm gonna go over what we have. We have our plaster of Paris there. We have our just Home Depot play sand over here. And those two items both combined run you about $25 at the hardware store. So it's a fairly cheap alternative to actual refractory cement, as I mentioned. We're gonna need a mixing container. We're gonna need plastic wrap. We're gonna need a measuring container slash scoop, a pencil, tape measure, of course our foundry body over here. And we're gonna need something cylindrical that we can put in the middle of our cement mixture to make sure that we have an open cavity in the center where the fire will actually exist and where we can put our crucible in to receive heat. Oh yeah, before we go any further, please mask and eye protection is very important, especially the mask when dealing with any sort of powdered substances. And you really don't wanna get it in your eyes either because obvious reasons. All right, the first we're going to do is get an idea of how deep this is. This measurement is fairly important just to make sure that we're getting a, a reasonable cover of our cement down on the inside. So it looks like we're just about at 16 inches. Perfect. So I want about three inches of cover on the bottom of this. So what I'll be doing, in this case it's 16 inches, I'll be taking three off of that. And so I'll put a mark 13 inches up on this item that we'll be using to create our cavity. So this is seven and a half inches in diameter. This is about 12 inches in diameter. So we'll end up with a two and a quarter inch ring of material all the way around. So that should just about do it. Although if you can get away with more, I'd recommend it. Probably should have used a Sharpie. All right, just something that we can be sure to see. Now, of course, we don't want to crack our plaster of Paris and pulling our form out. So what I'm going to be doing is actually putting a layer between it and the actual plaster or refractory cement by use of this plastic wrap. With any luck, this should make removal much easier later on down the road. This won't really lend itself to having a very clean appearance on the inside, but quite frankly, I don't care. All right, so next we're going to have to sort of approximate the volume to know how much we're going to mix. All right, so for my measuring, I'm going to be using this coffee can. This can hold a weight of coffee equal to 30.5 ounces. And we need to make sure we have a clean mixing container as well. I haven't exactly determined how I'm going to figure out the volume yet. Uh, considering I'll probably be better off over mixing than under mixing, I'm gonna aim high. And three. All right. You know, things are about to get serious when the sleeves get rolled up. All right, and the clock is ticking. All right, now I want to push this down and try to keep it centered up to that mark that we made earlier, which we should be able to see. Right there, with any luck, it'll be close. It's just about perfect. Okay, so now, I've gotta hold this until it's dry. Yay. All right, so I ended up removing some of the material inside of it, just pouring some out into the bucket, and I added some more plaster of Paris because, like I stated, it looked a little bit runny, and it turns out it was. It had too much water, and it wasn't setting up. So what I decided to do was add the rest of my plaster of Paris. So I used a full 25 pounds in this, and along with the, uh, a little less than equal amount of sand. I was trying to sort of increase the plaster of Paris content, just because I wanted to make sure that it did, in fact, set up nicely. All right, it's been about 21 hours now, and with any luck, this is set up completely. Uh, I don't know if it's cured all the way through. Probably not, because there's so much mass here, and it is not very warm outside, but regardless, I think we're gonna to try to pull out that tank today and we're gonna find out if the saran wrap idea did anything at all or whether this is gonna be a nightmare. Wish me luck. I have no idea why I thought that would be easier than it was. <sighs> I literally, literally spent all day trying to get this stupid thing out. I have no idea why it was so difficult, but I literally broke a come along trying to pull this out. I had to resort to using my pickup truck to pull this out in four low. Some of you, it's so bad. Some of you don't even know what that means. 
a little embarrassed, not gonna lie, but it's out now. The results are definitely not pretty. It got beat up pretty bad, but we're just gonna go with it because this is only cosmetic. But anyway, on a more positive note, this is what the inside of our furnace looks like. Uh, it turned out to be pretty well centered and it turned out to be pretty well aligned as far as uh, the edges go straight down. So I guess I can't really complain too much, but the next step is to actually create the hole into the side that will be the outlet of our burn vessel here. And that'll be the same three inch axle material. So I've got a three inch hole saw, which will be just about perfect for this material here. So I'm gonna go ahead and drill that out while it's still soft. So that three inch hole saw that I just showed you, yeah, my mandrel is too small. You know, it's been one of those days, it really has. As far as placement goes, that's important because we don't want to have it all the way at the bottom of our foundry uh, because if there's any sort of failure of the crucible, then the aluminum will ooze out and it'll possibly go down. Not that it's a big deal in this case, but it could run down and back into a burn vessel. We just don't want to have to clean up that mess, <laughs> even if there is a way to clean it up, which there's really not. So to avoid that issue, what we're going to do is we're going to come up probably, I don't know, two inches. Two inches sounds good. Improvise, adapt, overcome. So at this point, it's just a matter of eyeballing to try to get that angle right, because you want this side of this hole to go with this side of the foundry uh, cavity, if you will. So we're going to try to keep this as level as we can and shoot in at an angle. At this point, just do the best you can. And done. That works surprisingly well. So that's welded on and just coupled in place slid over this pipe here and this is about what it's going to look like the rest is all going to be done uh, just framework so it's quite simple there are three more things that i need to do and that is to bring up an arm here and then put a pivot point here on the side of the tank here that i can use as the inside of a hinge so it'll fit inside of a piece of pipe up on the stand and then i need to make some sort of cradle that this can fall over onto in order for it to be a forge type setup All right, so if it didn't make sense before, we've got foundry, forge. It's quite heavy, by the way. Foundry, forge, foundry, forge. <laughs> I'm quite pleased with this. It does rotate fairly well on that, as well as I could expect steel on steel with no grease. Well, the bracing is all done, but one thing I just thought of that I realized I didn't consider yet is how I'm going to get this thing out through that door. All right, if you're just joining me from the beginning segment of this video, then I'm sure we can definitely get a deep understanding of this whole system without going through the build process. And if you watch the whole video through, I thank you very much. And I hope you were able to learn something from it and get a little more detail about exactly this system. All right, so we're gonna start from the beginning of the process and work our way towards the final result, just to keep an order to what we're explaining and hopefully give you guys a complete understanding of how this works. If you're left with any questions, then please feel free to comment in the comment section down below. And I'll be more than happy to get back to you with hopefully good answers to whatever questions you have. So we're going to start at the very beginning. So our first stop is actually our air intake. Now this is a blower inside of this housing which I just made out of assembling some tin cans. Basically this is a number 10 can which just happened to fit perfectly inside of the blower for a late 90s model Toyota RAV4. This is actually the heater blower so when you turn your car on to hot or cold and you turn the fan on to high or low or whatever this is what's doing all that work they're very quiet fans they move a high volume and also they push through a lot of crevices in your car's dash so they have a plenty of force behind them so i like using them for a lot of projects if i have them on hand 
So number 10 can, normal soup can. I've got a grate to prevent stuff from going in. And then I've got another soup can coming off the side here, and this is all soldered together just with metal working solder. And then I've got a cone that I made out of thin eighth inch sheet metals, which is soldered onto here, and then welded onto this one and a quarter inch piece of Schedule 80 pipe. Now, one quick thing before I go any further, remember that this is all made from scrap material. That's what I like doing because it's a great way to save money, and it's also a great way to recycle. Not to mention, on top of this whole quarantine thing, a lot of the metal shops around where I live are non-essential, and so I wasn't able to purchase steel for any of this project, but that's totally understandable. So anyway, back to what we were doing. Basically, this pipe just feeds air into our burn vessel, and this is also where we have the introduction of our fuel, which is our oil. I've got a vat up there that you saw earlier in the video if you watched the whole thing through, or you might have seen it in my waste oil furnace video, but basically it's just a five gallon jug with a brass gate valve, which is threaded into the cap, and I can open that up to allow oil down and through the tube. Now, the gate valves are kind of nice because they're brass on brass. There are no rubber gaskets or anything to become, you know, impregnated with oil. It just avoids a lot of problems. So is it the best valve for this? Maybe not, maybe it is, I don't know, but it's what I'm using and that's the reason why. So I've got that running through a bit of 3 8 inch hose and that runs into this brake line. Now this brake line is a metal brake line, of course, and it's quite long right now because I don't know where I'm going to put this yet. I don't know where I'm going to need to run this oil feed tube. So I'm leaving it just for now, but of course this would be quite a bit shorter and there's no actual reason for this length. So that oil gravity feeds down into the tube where it goes about halfway down to this piece of one and a quarter inch pipe and then it makes a 90 degree. But when you're bending this, be very careful not to make any pinches that could restrict the flow of oil because this does require quite a bit. Oh, and one more thing, I would recommend using some sort of drip system where you're able to visually see how much oil is dropping through and you can do that with a simple T or you can do that with a simple, uh, I don't know what you call them, but they're, but they're the four-way uh, female on every side sort of plus sign pipe fittings where you can run four pieces of pipe together. Those work really well and you can see because you have light coming through the other side, the oil dripping down so you can know how much you're actually adding to the system. So that goes down here, feeds to the tube, and then it runs into a burn vessel, like I said, and this is just actually a tank from an air compressor that I recycled. It's got a lot of fancy things on the side, but none of those are actually, uh, are actually important to the functionality. So on top, we've got just a two inch cap because this is where ignition takes place, where we actually light the system in the oil. So we're gonna remove that. And down inside of there, which is quite dark, I doubt you'll be able to see, but you're really not missing much. Basically that tube just goes about half an inch into this pipe at an angle. And that's to generate a cyclone effect in here. And that's for a couple of reasons. Number one, we wanna make sure that our oil and air are very well mixed. Number two, uh, because if you, I'm not sure if you're familiar with how a fire triangle works, but basically you need three things to support combustion, combustion and that is heat, fuel, and air. Now we have our fuel, we have our air, but in order to sustain combustion on something that's so difficult to ignite like oil, we have to have a source of heat so it can actually atomize, turn into a vapor, where it will burn very easily and very effectively. And also very completely, there will be very little emission put out by any sort of waste oil device if it's constructed properly, which is actually pretty counterintuitive to think about, but it is in fact true. But anyway, this oil feed line runs just right flush to the end of the air inlet pipe, and then that's where the oil and air mix. They swirl around in here, and then eventually they make their way out of this, which is just a piece of axle, actually. It's three inches on the outside, and then we have another piece going through here, and we have a piece of two-inch flat bar that I curled into a circle and then welded onto this part here and that acts as a rotating coupling. So what happens is when I adjust my lever to go into forge mode, into foundry mode or whatever, you can see they just rotate independently and because they're the same size and that's a pretty snug fit, there is no slop and it should work just fine with no issues. The fire you're going to see at the end of this explanation is actually the first fire of this device but I'm pretty confident that it'll work. Anyway, this is a, I believe a 10 gallon propane tank. I cut the end off of, of course. And then that tube that I just mentioned goes in and you can probably see it just runs about flush with this wall here. And we also wanna generate a cyclone inside of this just to try to distribute our heat evenly around whatever it is that we're trying to heat up. Now, uh, one thing I didn't think about is the fact that because you see that the uh, inlet to the foundry is actually up at the top, what would be the top when it's in forge mode, that might not effectively get heat to whatever we're trying to put in to heat to forge if it's sitting in the bottom. So you might have to set it up on blocks, I don't know. Of course I haven't done any forging with it yet, I've actually never even forged, so 
but this is going to be a great starting tool. So anyway, we have a refractory cement here, and what I've done is I've actually just taken a mix of very approximately 50% plaster of Paris and 50% sand, mixed them with a portion amount of water to get a nice slurry, and then I poured this into it and also had a form in the center, of course, to take up the space necessary. That was done before even cutting the hole in here, which if you watched the whole video through, you probably would have seen that, but for everyone new, I'm just explaining in great detail, so we're all hopefully on the same understanding. There's about three inches of material in the bottom as well. And something that you need to consider is the fact that this, really? What's up, Jimmy? She has to make into every video, I swear. You wanna keep this outlet a little ways off the bottom of your container, so when it's in foundry mode, if you have any uh, breaches in the crucible and all of your liquid metal pour out, they remain in the bottom and they don't backflow through the system and end up in here, where they will basically be impossible to get out. But anyway, moving on from that, Okay, I'm sorry, but look at this. Look at this ham. Okay, so mounted on this side of the propane tank is a bit of one inch pipe. And that is hopefully, if my measurements were correct, about right in the center of rotation of this pipe here, the inlet pipe. So because it's rotating on that cuff, we want it to rotate the same amount here so you don't have any jamming. And so far it seems to work pretty well. So just to explain what's going on here, it's really not terribly complicated. The only thing actually attached to this tank is this bit of one inch water pipe. And inside of that one inch water pipe is this bit of one inch shaft here. In case you don't know, water pipe is measured by the internal diameter, not the external. So we have our one inch shaft with a hole drilled in this end to accept a three eighths inch bolt. And also of course there is corresponding holes drilled in the piece of one inch pipe. And then that's put through there as a pan just to hold everything together. And then that shaft runs through another bit of one inch pipe. And this was just on the pipe because I pulled it out of the scrap bin. I really don't know what it's for, but I thought it looked cool, so I left it. <laughs> but then coming over to here, of course, we need something to grab onto and give us leverage. And so I've just used a piece of rebar here and then actually a railroad spike on top because it has a nice handle shape to it. And then I made this mechanism that runs all the way down to pull this latch, uh, which of course just sits in this little catch here. Let me give you an idea of how that works. So we pull the lever, which is very satisfying to do, by the way. Hold on. I want you to appreciate this. Okay, Okay. so we've got a connecting rod running all the way there. It runs down onto this sort of knife latch here. And of course, that's got a pivot point here, which is pretty self-explanatory, but it's locked into place as is. Lift it up, and then when it's down here, it sits in this cradle, which is just made out of two-inch flat bar. And then it sits in there, and then gravity keeps it in place because this is actually very heavy. And then the frame, as you can probably see, is just constructed from one and a half inch by one and a half inch angle iron that I had laying around, left over from the tank project. That's also where the axles came from, by the way. And then just some various bits of metal here and there for support. So yeah, that's, uh, I think, about it. Hopefully that answers any questions you might have. But of course, all of that means nothing until you see it work. So next, the startup procedure. All right, guys, so now we're actually going to start up our system. And the first thing we're going to do is start off with a little piece of rag like this. We're gonna poke it down into our inlet, or our ignition port, rather. And we're just gonna leave a little bit of a tail sticking out. And now to that rag, we're gonna apply some more waste motor oil. Just a little bit, doesn't really take much. Just a little, little teeny, just a tiny bit, just a li little itty, itty bitty bit, just like that much, there we go. And then all we have left to do from here is, of course, light it on fire, which is the fun part. Now it is quite bright out today, so I'm not sure if you'll be able to see the flame, but we're just going to ignite that. Make sure it's burning well, and then we drop it in. Pretty simple. All right, now that we've got our flame going down in there, we're actually gonna come over here, and we're going to apply power to our motor. Just like that. And now we're gonna go ahead and throw our cap back on. And this will take some time to get up to temperature because in order for it to function really well, this all has to be hot before that can happen. Also, one quick thing. When you're pouring the oil over it, it's uh, you don't really want to get it on the outside of this because that's going to smoke like a... Anyway. I removed the cap just to give it a little bit more airflow because it's easier for the flame to start when it's going straight up because of the heat. Uh, you'll know it's ready when it starts sounding like you live next to an airport. <laughs> Man, I wish you guys could feel the heat coming off of this thing. Whew. Make sure you have a, a well cleared area around where there's no potential fire hazards because this thing in itself is a fire hazard. So keep that in mind. 
safe to say it's only been about five minutes actually and uh, safe to say this is this is definitely hot enough <laughs> Woo. all right guys it's a little bit janky but this is actually my crucible for today it's just a steel hubcap so it can withstand a lot higher temperatures than what the aluminum can so it should work pretty well also, that was a great pun. I'd just like to point that out. So what we're gonna do, brush up some aluminum cans, throw them in there, and I've actually got some aluminum from a previous melt that I just did with some firewood and a hole in the ground and a hair dryer. So this is just melted down cans as well. We're gonna throw that in, and we're just gonna see if we can get this up to a decent enough temperature to actually liquefy. I have, I have no doubts that we will, guys. <laughs> thing is that this actually doesn't burn nearly as cleanly as I thought it would although it's not that bad it's not actually as clean as my waste oil furnace that I used to heat my shop which is surprising because I guarantee you this is much 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 hotter I have no idea what's going on in there guys I can't see a thing oh that's hot while that's melting over there I just wanted to go over a quick side note uh, whenever you're working with any kind of flame be sure to work with cotton clothing because if it's a synthetic fiber, then it can actually melt and it will burn and stick to your skin like napalm. So it's something that you don't hear about much, but it's very, very important to wear cotton clothing when working with any sort of open flame. So please be safe. Guys, this is, I'm not sure if you can see this or not, but it's actually glowing red. This tank is glowing red, red hot. <laughs> this is no joke, be very safe with this. This is why I actually keep my oil fairly far away. So if we have any kind of malfunctions, <laughs> Uh, we don't have anything that's really, really bad, hopefully. We don't add any fuel to any fires. It's actually burning a lot better now. I'm pleased with this. I'm very, very pleased. All right, I guess this just wasn't warmed up enough. And by the way, I'm keeping all of this in just to give you guys uh, a genuine beginning process to this because it's all part of experimentation, right? This is a brand new device to me. The concept has been done before, but this layout I don't believe has ever been done on YouTube, so... It's all part of the learning experience. So we can see now that we're actually burning totally clean. I don't see any smoke coming out of this whatsoever. And we're definitely still generating enough heat. I'm trying not to get the camera too close, but you can see the aluminum down there, totally molten. Well, a little mushy, but he'll get there. All right, now that we're burning a lot better, I think is actually uh, what happened was a lot of the oil that I dumped in there uh, was burning off, which is why we got that big flame. So now what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to take the top of the propane tank and I'm going to set it on there just to keep some of that heat in and hopefully heat it a little bit more efficiently. I'll make a proper door eventually, but today is not that day. That is molten aluminum if I've ever seen it. What do you think guys? Should I start a cooking show? <laughs> so yeah, uh, we're not going to be doing any casting with it today, but the point has been made that it does in fact melt aluminum. I went ahead and shut that off just so I could hear myself think for once. Uh, so this is obviously molten aluminum. As you can see, it did in fact complete it. And this opens up a whole new opportunity for projects. I can now make cast aluminum parts. I have a lot of projects in mind for what I'm gonna do with this in the future, but if you have any suggestions on things you'd like to see built out of cast aluminum or parts you'd like to see made or whatever, then please let me know in the comment section down below because I'm always open to ideas. So I'm just gonna let this cool down. Again, I'm not gonna be doing any casting today, but that'll hopefully be in an upcoming video. Hopefully you're not disappointed. But we've proven the viability of the furnace and that's exactly what I intended to do. And now just for fun, even though there's really no difference, I'm gonna turn it back on and put it in forge mode, see what happens. All right, our shutdown procedure is pretty simple. What we're going to do first is actually come over here and we're going to shut off our oil. So now we have no fuel running to our system. Now, what I'm actually going to choose to do, I'm actually going to leave this blower going and I'm going to let this burn completely out, which it actually sounds like it already did. So we were putting in just the perfect amount of oil, which is fantastic. Actually, a little bit more may have been good to get a little more heat, but I'm happy with the results and I hope you are too. So I'm going to let this run uh, fresh, cool air through this whole thing just to take care of the residual heat to make it safer. And I'm going to stick with it until it's cool and I'm sure that there won't be any hazards that exist. One thing I'd like to mention is that this is completely cool. This needs to remain cool, of course, because we don't want our oil heating up inside of this pipe or we could have a fire leading back 
uh, or a flash off of oil or something really bad that we just don't want to deal with. So this is totally cool to the touch, surprisingly, considering its proximity to that. And all that solder is totally intact. All right, guys, uh, this is actually the end of the video. Now you've seen its functionality, you've seen the building, and you know my reasons behind building it. So I hope that you learned something from this video. I hope that if you had thought about building one of these and weren't sure where to start, this could help you out. And for you again, if you have any questions, then please let me know and I'll try to answer them to the best of my abilities. I hope you guys all have a great day. I hope you're staying safe out there. If you'd like to support the channel, the best thing you can do right now is either leave a like on the video or if you could subscribe to not miss any more cool content, especially the future projects involving this, that would be greatly appreciated. But until next time, take care.